Assalamualaikum dan selamat pagi. Dah puteruskan Wong Ling. Okay, um, any question that you like to ask from the previous lecture? Anything yang um, maybe you need clarification or if there is any confusion before I proceed with the, our discussion on the gelatinization. We are, we are still discussing uh, gelatinization and today we are going to discuss about some of the factors which can uh, affect gelatinization. Yeah? Then after that we will move on to uh, discuss about retrogradation. Uh, in Nenmodo, uh, I have shared a link to some of the online presentation from the industry. As much as you can, as much as, as possible, please watch those industry presentation. They are experts. So when they talk about modified starch, I think there is uh, recently I shared one link, modified starch 101, I think, right? Yeah. Those are given for, uh, by expert from the industry. They are the expert. I'm not the expert. Yeah? Well, maybe less expert than them, maybe. <laughs> so I would encourage you to watch those presentation and if possible, if you can find time, do a summary. And if you feel like sharing, sh share it on Enmodo. So now, um, so no question. Good. So I take it as you understand everything. Um, as far as gelatinization process is concerned, there are many factors that can affect the process. The starch itself, the properties of the starch itself, and the processing condition that we use, the types of uh, ingredients we use to, uh, you know, that we add as part of the food uh, formulation in the food to, be, to, to make a product. So these are all the different things that can affect the gel gelatinization process. When I say affecting gelatinization, what I mean here, the degree of cooking, the degree of gelatinization, the extent, how fast, how much. Yeah? And uh, so some, in, in some condition, we want the starch to just cook or gelatinize sufficiently. In some cases, we, do, uh, we want the starch to uh, we don't want the starch to overcook, you know, <coughs> because when you overcook the starch, maybe you get other other effect. And in in some cases, you can get a situation where you undercook the starch, meaning that you don't get complete gelatinization. So if you don't get complete gelatinization, but in the actual product you want to achieve certain degree of gelatinization, then you will have problem later in the quality of the product, you know. So these are the things we have to understand. If you look at this diagram, this is actually a schematic presentation of the microstructure of potato starch dispersion in relation to viscosity and iodine binding capacity. Iodine would bind to the amylose component to form the blue color. Uh, for amylopectin, um, the color is not dark blue, but maybe, you know, just like purplish or brown color. So we can actually measure the binding of iodine to the starch, to the amylose component by using titration or by using spectroscopy method to see the changes in the uh, blue color. So you can measure using a visible spectro photometry in the visible range. Then you can measure the absorbance and so on. So by using this technique, we can monitor the changes in the iodine binding capacity of the starch for the whole duration of the gelatinization. And we can plot a graph like this. And at the same time, we can measure the changes in the viscosity. So now on this graph, we have two things here. One is the iodine binding capacity and another one is the changes in the viscosity. It's a function of the cooking of the heating uh, program. 
and we can measure the changes in the viscosity. Uh, we measure here on the, uh, on the SI unit, Pascal second, rather than uh, the RVA unit. Then we measure the iodine binding capacity. And of course, we can also look under the microscope from the previous lecture. I think we have seen this, the changes from the discrete granule in the native granule before cooking and they start to swell and deform and break up, disrupted and finally form like a homogeneous uh, colloidal uh, solution. But uh, in, in this form, you know, you have a ghost granule or deformed granule. So we can see here the, the extent of uh, gelatinization during the pasting process can uh, can be very different depending on how much shear we put in, how much cooking, how long is the holding time, how, what, how high is the temperature, whether we cook at atmospheric pressure or we cook under elevated pressure uh, like in, in the autoclave or in the retort. So this would determine whether we will get this, this, this or that. And if we measure the iodine binding capacity at each of this stage, you will see that it will show a trend like that, increase, and after that, more or less plateau. At the same time, you can see the viscosity start to decrease. So, I think this can we can we can explain this quite easily, because when initially the viscosity increase because the granules swell. And the viscosity of the continuous phase also increase because we have the amylose, the short fragments or short chain of linear amylose to leach out. It will increase the viscosity of the continuous phase. At the same time, the grain will swell. So both effects would actually increase the viscosity up to a certain point when the grain will start to break up, rupture. Just like the balloon, burst. And now, most, if not all, of the amylose already sort of leach out and form as part of the continuous phase. So the viscosity will increase up to a certain point, then after that will continue to decrease. Iodine binding, on the, on the other hand, initially will increase because we have the amylose component, especially, especially those already leach out from the granule, will bind the iodine and give the blue color. But when more and more amylose is leached out from the granule, when the granule start to uh, rupture or break, then it will increase. But most of the amylose, when it has been uh, leached out from the granule, up to a certain point, no more amylose, or, or all the amylose already been bound to, uh, or form complex with the iodine. So we don't expect further increase in the blue color. So the point that uh, I'm trying to say from this slide is we can actually monitor the changes in the viscosity as well as other physical parameters during the, the gelatinization by using this kind of uh, experiment. Yeah? Um, so when we uh, come across say, a new type of starch that we don't know the properties very much, we can carry out this kind of experiment to, to characterize the starch, especially if the information is not much, is not available uh, very much for that starch. Another type of, um, or another way to characterize the gelatinization of starch, and perhaps the more, it's quite, uh, I would say, very popular method we can use and very convenient also, very easy, is by using DSC, Differential Scanning Calorimeter. Uh, I'm sure you have learned in IMG 204 about DSC. I don't know whether you have experience using it. Maybe part of your final year project later, probably you will be able, you will get opportunity to use. But DSC is actually a very convenient way to monitor gelatinization. RVA is one, but in RVA, we monitor the increase in viscosity. Right? In DSC, we monitor the thermal changes 
associated with the endothermic change of the gelatinization. When the starch gelatinizes, the process is endothermic. It will absorb heat because heat is required to break up the hydrogen bond between the amylose and amylopectin in the granule. So heat is required to, to, to break the hydrogen bond. So the process is endothermic. And we can capture, we can detect this endothermic event by using the differential scanning calorimeter. And it will show up in the form of peak. Nice. Well, this is very nice because it's very sharp. <laughs> but usually though you don't get that very sharp. You probably get, you know, something like this. This to me very sharp. But I think it's a I don't know whether it's a real data or just schematic, yeah. But uh, it is quite unusual to get a very sharp peak like this. Usually like this. That's a typical of star. If you have a pure crystal, if you have a pure crystal, you put in a DLC, pure crystal means 100% crystal. You put in a DLC, you heat up above the melting point of the crystal, usually you will get a sharp peak like this. Because pure crystal would have a sharp melting point. So all the crystal would melt more or less at the same time. Pew, melt. Of course, you don't hear the sound like that. <laughs> but it will melt just like Lego. You know, you have a structure, then you, you know, do something to collapse it. To, pew, if you have 100% crystal, then you'll get this very sharp peak. But in starch, remember starch is semi-crystalline, right? About 30%, 40% crystalline phase. The amylopectin component in starch, right? Contribute to that. And also the crystal in starch, that the A pattern, B pattern, is not really a perfect crystal. They have a different stability, they have a different, you know. So when they melt, they don't melt like immediately. It will take some time. So this least, the least stable, yang paling, paling kurang stabil, the least stable crystal will melt first, followed by the more stable crystal. So that's why in DSC of starch, you would see something like this, more broad. In fact, when we carry out the SC analysis for different type of starch, you will get, you will see the the broadness or the narrowness of the endothermic peak is different. That tells you that tells you something about the, the 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 nature of the crystallinity of the starch. If you get a sharper peak, means the starch has a more homogeneous crystal structure because they melt at a narrow range, narrower range. If you get more broad, meaning they have a more broader uh, crystalline structure. That gives us information about the starch when we do a comparison. Um, what you see here, um, when we carry out the gelatinization in excess water, remember what is excess water? More than 60%. So in the DSC, usually, we have a small sample pen, very small, very small. You have to handle with care. It is made of aluminum. There are two parts, the, the, the pen, the bowl, and the lid. Yeah? Each one, the bowl itself, the bottom part, costs around 250 ringgit, the top part, 250 ringgit. No, sorry, not that expensive. I mean, uh, no, it's about now uh, 10 to 15 ringgit each. So one sample pen, when you run the analysis BSC, uh, it costs about 25 to 30 ringgit. So better be careful. It's expensive analysis. Yeah. So you put a sample inside a sample pen. It's very little, about 2.5 to 5 milligram. Then you add water. 
So usually in excess water means in the assay, we add one part of solid dry starch, three parts of water. That is excess water. Under this condition, you will get complete gelatinization if we heat the starch above the gelatinization temperature and you will get this kind of peak, a single peak. A single peak, but maybe not this sharp again, but a single peak. And uh, the uh, scientist has given this, the name for this peak as G endotherm, G. Yeah? G endotherm. So when you read a book, you, you come across the term G endotherm, M endotherm. So G refer to this single peak when starch is gelatinized under excess water. That's all. So now what happened now? Instead of three to one, we reverse. Yeah? One to three. One part of water, three part of starch. So in this case, we get, we, now we have a, a situation of gelatinization under limited water. So what happens under limited water, we don't get, we will get, when we do the DSC, we will get this kind of peak. There are one endotherm here, another endotherm there, which is more broader. And this second endotherm, yeah, is called M endotherm. And this will occur at higher temperature. So we call it G plus M. If we reduce the amount of water even more, just like almost like dry, but not, not so dry, but even more limited moisture or water, you'll get like this, even broader and shifted to much higher temperature. So what this means is, when we cook starch under, if the amount of water is less, the less the, the amount of water the higher the temperature is needed to achieve complete gelatinization. The gelatinization, temp or put it in another way, the gelatinization temperature or the range of gelatinization temperatures now would be shifted to a higher temperature when gelatinization is done under limited amount of water. So, this is important because now, this, this, this is an important fact. Less amount of water, higher temperature is needed to cook the starch completely. And therefore, knowing this, then maybe you want to extend, prolong the cooking time if you want to achieve complete gelatinization. Or we can, uh, other than prolong prolong the time, we can increase the combination, uh, we can also increase the temperature. Or, we can cook the starch under elevated pressure, rather than atmospheric pressure. So, we can cook under in the autoclave, or we can put in the retort. Yeah? Or, how many or? <laughs> <laughs> we can try to uh, we can we can use a starch, we can which can cook at lower, or which can start to gelatinize at lower temperature. Meaning we can uh, we we can use a starch with lower onset of gelatinization. So these are the different ways. Yeah, we can, we will come to that. Uh, so so the conclusion from this experiment, the onset of gelatinization shifted to a higher temperature when the water content is becoming limited. So, and we can see the effect of this. Yeah? I've asked this slide, I've asked this question a few times in the exam already, uh, because this is very important. Uh, you can see here, this example of excess water content. So we can, we can see here, if complete gelatinization is achieved, this picture below is a real picture from a real experiment. This picture below shows that, uh, and we put the dye actually, in this case we put pewarna dye. The green color is actually protein, because this is actually wheat flour. It's a bread, it's a bread. 
So we use uh, our, the, the green color there is actually a protein. But you can see actually the blue color there, which is the, the uh, amylose iodine complex. So you can see here, all, this is a system under limited wa moisture, limited water. Some gelatinization still occur, but limited. And you can see the granule structure still visible, although they are deformed, yeah, but they are still there. So this excess water system is an example of, uh, you know, product like soup. Yeah, product like soup. This one product like uh, cookies, where we have very low amount of water. And in cookies also, we have sugar. So when we add a lot of sugar, sugar then sugar itself is very hydrophilic molecule, and they are small molecule. So they can compete with water more efficiently than the starch. So when we add more sugar, they will add more water molecules, and now less water molecules available for starch to gelatinize. So that is also uh, give the effect of similar to low moisture system. When you add sugar or anything that can bind water effi more efficiently than starch, that will also give the same effect like low moisture system as well. So meaning that when we add more sugar, the effect will be will increase the jelly transition temperature of the starch. So when we add more sugar, if you want to get complete jelly transition, then we have to take a few steps to, to, to uh, uh, overcome that problem. Yeah? So that is the effect of ratio of water to starch on gelatinization. Let's look at another effect of, in this case now, it's a processing condition. We have to take a few steps to, to, to uh, uh, overcome that problem. Yeah? So that is the effect of ratio of water to starch on gelatinization. Let's look at another effect of, in this case now, it's a processing condition. Shear. Why we have shear? We have because we mix, we homogenize, or, you know, so always there's some form of shear during the processing. So, in this case, we have normal mass and we have waxy mass. Remember the difference between normal mass and waxy mass? In the form, in the, in the, uh, with respect to uh, the amylose content, normal mass contain around 25%, or maybe less, slightly less. Waxy mass contain less than 1% amylose. When the starch, when when the mass, uh, when the mass starch uh, gelatinized, uh, waxy mass would, uh, waxy mass granule would uh, swell much more faster and easier than the normal mass. So the, the viscosity would increase very fast compared to normal mass. Remember the previous lecture? But then, it will reach the maximum uh, swelling and become very fragile and it will also now start to break, break a rupture and the viscosity drop also very fast. That is the characteristic of vaccine mass. Whereas normal mass will lose the viscosity rather slowly, right? The same also the effect of, of shear. So waxy mass granules are more, fra more fragile, more fragile compared to normal mass, because normal mass has about 25% amylose, and that provides the strength to the granule, compared to waxy mass which contain around only you know, less than 1%. So we can see the effect here. In normal mass, after shear, waxy mass after shear, I think picture tells again ten story. <laughs> this time, thousand story, right? I don't have to convince you. The picture would convince you. So, the conclusion here: why we see such a significant uh, difference here? Because waxy maize granules are more fragile, and they are more prone to disruption 
this integration by shear. So now if we measure the viscosity in this case, when they have reached the same uh, cooking, cooking time, cooking point, gelatinization point, we measure the viscosity, which one would you expect to have higher viscosity? Assuming that we start with the same concentration. We imagine this one would have a higher viscosity. But mind you, later when we talk about the application of starch and the selection of starch, viscosity is not everything. Okay? So actually the in terms of the mouthfeel, in terms of the rheological properties, in terms of uh, the the overall perception, in terms of the stickiness, the stringiness and they, 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 they are different. So viscosity is not the only thing that we need to decide in selecting starch. Later, we will come to that. So that's the effect of shear. Next is the effect of the presence of other ingredients, in this case, in this case, fat, lipid. In most food, we always have fat. Yeah? So when we have fat, the fat would now uh, modify the gelatinization property of starch. In what way? How? The starch, the fat, would form a complex with the amylose. So we have learned about this uh, also in food ingredient. It will form complex with the amylose. And we know amylose is the component uh, which is responsible to, uh, in the retrogradation process. So when the fat form complex with amylose, it would reduce the tendency of the starch to retrograde. Because now amylose is not available for crystallization because it, had, it has formed complex with uh, fat. It has been sort of rendered inactive in a way. Lah. Yeah? Because it has formed complex not available to, uh, f to crystallize. So what happens when we add fat? Again, I like to illustrate the point using pictures. Yeah? Can you see here A, B, C, D? What is A? A, uh, in this case, we use SEM, yeah? scanning electron microscope. A is micrograph of a potato starch granule in A, heated at 80 degrees, 10, minute, 10 minutes. The interlace network is a leach out amylose. The interlace network refer to this like cobweb structure here. This is really a, a beautiful um, picture. Well, beautiful in the sense that it can, they can capture this effect. So you can see the amylose leach out from the granule. All this while we imagine, hmm, we just imagine, right? But actually when we capture it, it looks like that. It looks like, uh, you know, how do we describe this? They call it interlaced network, you know, like a cobweb structure. Macam sarang laba-laba, kan? Ataupun something like benang or whatever lah. But this is a granule, swell, because it's been heated to 80 degree. So 80 degree for potato maybe just slightly over or maybe at the peak maximum swelling not yet rupture there's a special technique actually to sort of frozen in time the process and capture that very difficult advanced technique but thanks god we have this so we can show you now b here is potato starch granules heated at 80 degree, but now instead of 10 minutes, we extend it, prolong it to 10 minutes. Uh, sorry, prolong it to 30 minutes, three times longer. So here, more and more amylose leach out and form a sort of wrap up the granule. So we have more heavily interlaced network form around the granule. This structure reminds me, apa ni, alien kan? Yang the 
they wrap around the something like something like this also lah. Yeah, but it also looks like a cut web. But what happens here is actually you get more and more amyloids now form a network around the granule. C, well, C now. C is potato granule heated at 80 degree, 30 minutes, same as B, but in the presence of 0.25% C16. One monoglyceride is a very, very good, efficient, effective emulsifier. One mono and diglyceride. So what happens here? This monoglyceride, not, uh, not the absence of leach amylose. Leachine aja. Yeah? You don't see that cobweb structure, the interlaced amylose network. Where the amylose gone? Where has the amylose gone? Huh? Inside? Or disappear? Or dissolve? Huh? Dissolve. <laughs> Yeah, it has formed a complex with monoglyceride and prevent it from leaching out to the out to to outside the granule. And here, D, potato starch granule heated at eighty degree thirty minutes, same heating condition with C, but in the presence of one percent instead of. 0.25, so it's one percent more. C18 type monoglyceride. Not the amount of leach amylose is higher than in C. So we can say now from this ex experiment, this type of emulsifier compared to this type of emulsifier, this one is less effective than this one. Uh, when we look at the amount of amylose leach out. So, this to apply this knowledge, you know, this is where we use emulsifier in product like noodles, yeah, to prevent to to reduce the stickiness of the noodle surface. Product like instant noodle, we can use this emulsifier so that uh, when you add the hot water to the instant noodle, you know, you don't get very sticky kind of you know structure. It looks very smooth. And, and so on. So that's the effect of repeat on the st structure. But how does lipid formation of amylose lipid complex affect gelatinization? It doesn't say here. It just show you. But how does it affect the gelatinization? Would it Increase or shift the gelatinization temperature to a higher or lower temperature? Higher. Why? More difficult one. Yeah. Yeah, I can see the more difficult for amylose to leach out, but how this affect the gelatinization? Ah. You have to relate it with the capacity of the granule to swell. When the amylose form a complex with lipid, actually the effect is, the indirect effect of that, or direct effect really, is to reduce the tendency of the granule to swell or slow down. So. Slow down swelling means it will shift that gel onset of gelatinization to a higher temperature. Okay, so that's the effect of adding fat or in fact emulsifier to the starch to the gelatinization. Yeah. Now, uh, yes. Yeah, Peg Hoon. <laughs> You're not happy. Okay. Well, uh, practically with the amylose, 
if the amylose is, available, uh, is uh, present on the surface, it will also form complex. In fact, actually, maybe, yes, maybe because during uh, gelatinization, we don't expect the emulsifier molecule depending on the type of, uh, that's why we can see the difference just now. The difference between this uh, emulsifier, C18 and C16. It depends on the efficiency of the emulsifier to form complex with the iodine. So, iodine pula, with the amylose. Okay? And um, you can find in the book, the, emulsifier, the ability of the emulsifier molecule to form complex with amylose can be ranked. And we have the so-called... Uh, uh, the amylose lipid complexing index. Yeah? So the more efficient the emulsifier can form, comp the less tendency of the granule to swell. Okay? But if it's not very efficient, meaning that during heating, during gelatinization, we will allow the granule to swell a bit and we have some amylose already leach out a little bit on the surface, but later, this amylose can also be uh, form, can form complex with the, the the lipid. But in this case, the onset, the change in the onset of gelatinization, gelatinization would not be shifted to a very, to a, uh, maybe not very significantly. Okay, so um, the conclusion from here is, when we let's say we carry out this experiment with four or five different types of emulsifiers. The higher the onset of gelatinization is shifted to higher temperature, the less efficient the, uh, sorry, the more efficient is the emulsifier in forming complex with the amylose. Depends, depends, depends on the size of the, uh, of the molecule. If we, if we use because the, the, the fat actually during uh, cooking can also break down into fatty acid, right? Especially if the pH is quite low and so on. So depend depending on the length of the fatty acid chain and, and so on. If we use emulsifier, depending on because remember the emulsifier also can can have a C uh, eighteen can have C eight C sixteen palmitic, so the structure. Depend also on the structure of the polar group. If you still, if you can recall when we learned about emulsifier, the polar group can be very small. The polar group can be a big chain also. The polar group can have branch also. And the uh, emulsifier chain, the tail, it can be a C18 linear. It can have branch. It can have double bond. It can have so, depending on the structure. That's why different emulsifiers have different efficiency as we saw in this picture. Uh, because we don't look at the concentration alone. This one is C18 and the C, this one is C16, one monoglyceride. This one, about 0.25%. This 1% C18 type monoglyceride. Again, it is the how efficient the emulsifier forming complex uh, with the amylose. Uh, concentration is not necessarily, necessarily you know, a fact. Um, well, we have to now go back to IMK 209. <laughs> okay? When, when we learn about how emulsifier can um, affect the emulsion stability. In, 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 um, in this case, the role of emulsifier is the surface active property. So to form a good emulsion, the emulsifier must form a, com a, a complete sort of layer around each droplet of the oil, right? So it's complete coverage. In that case, the concentration would play a role. 0.5%, 1% would give a different emulsion stability. In this case, it's nothing to do with the surface active property of the emulsifier. It is related to the ability of the amylose to form 
ability of the emulsifier to form complex with the amylose component. And to form complex, remember, maybe you can imagine now, the amylose form a helix structure. Okay? And the lipid or the emulsifier molecule will go inside that coil. Right? Do you think it's easy to go into that coil? <laughs> so now, the structure of the emulsifier would play a role. How big is the polar group? How long is the tail? Whether it has branch and not. So we, we can't really tell from the structure alone. So this is when, where we need to do some experiment to see the efficiency of each type of emulsifier. But of course, we don't really have to do that. There's a lot of information available. The industry already know which one is more efficient than others, and you know. So, the the guideline that we can use one um, if you want to choose the emulsifier, especially in the bakery uh, application for bread, cookies, cakes, and, and so on, is by looking at the complexing index of the emulsifier. This information is available. This is another um, picture that tell us a thousand story again. We have here control. Um, in this case, this is kanji kentang beramilosa tinggi, high amylose potato starch. Uh, this is actually the hybrid type of potato. Uh, in nature, secara semula jadi, there is no high amylose potato starch. But by using hybridization as well as genetic engineering, maybe all starch can be made high amylopectin or high amylose. Yeah? So in Europe, because Europe, they eat a lot of potato. So they do a lot of research in potato. In German, there is one research institute, Potato Research Institute. <coughs> in Thailand, we have Kasava Research Institute. In Malaysia, we have Sago Research Institute in Sarawak, Crown, eh? Crown Research. So anyway, uh, this experiment compares high amylose starch with, <coughs> no, it's a high amylose starch. All, all of these are high amylose starch. But the variables here is the heating time. Right? Heating time, yeah? Yeah, heating time. We have 60 here. Control means without heating. Then we have here increase from 60 to 100. So we add iodine. I read the text down here. <clears throat> the effect of high amylose starch on the texture of cooked potato. Uh, this one not. This one, the potato tuber, cook. Then we take a slice, it, a slice of add iodine, look under microscope. Uh, it's not powder, we cook the powder. We cook the potato tuber. Then we take a slice, add iodine, look under the microscope. Uh, and the effect of this on the texture of cooked potato. Sections of tubers from a control line and from high amylose starch line. Ah, this is high amylose. This is a control line means the normal potato, 25% amylose. Stain with iodine after either heating at 60 or boiling at 100, 60 or 100. The starch of the control line gelatinizes and swells at temperatures above about 68. So the starch in the cooked sample swells to fill the cell completely. In contrast, high amylose starch has a much higher gelatinization temperature and cooking does not swell the granules of the starch appreciably, giving the potatoes a succulent texture with more free water. So the purpose of this study is to look, to compare the texture when you bite the tuber between normal potato starch and high amylose starch. So when we hit 260 degrees Celsius, 
we can see the normal starch already have some blue stain, iodine stain. Whereas this one, not so. And we can see the cell swell appreciably compared to this one. When we increase, maybe not very obvious here, maybe, but when we increase to 100, we can see the normal starch, the granules, the cell swell appreciably, but this one still not so. So when we have this kind of cell structure in the potato, so when we eat this high amylose starch potato, high amylose potato starch compared to the normal starch, it will give the high amylose starch here will give a more succulent structure. How do I describe that? Yeah? More succulent structure with more free water. Yeah? How do I describe the succulent? But I think you can you imagine succulent structure? Cannot, huh? I can. <laughs> the normal starch maybe maybe you know just like when you eat normal starch, norm, normal potato you cook the apple in the potato you eat. But this one probably more you can feel the structure more. There's more bite. And it's supposed to sort of um, retain more free water. So the, when you eat the, the high amylose potato starch, you're supposed to, you know, because there's sort of more water release when you bite the starch. I have a hard time to explain this. <laughs> but I think I can imagine that. Yeah? If you cannot, then uh, you go back and sleep and try to imagine. <laughs> Okay, we stop here. So see you all next week, eh?